erectile dysfunction. Boy, that's a lovely euphemism for penile failure, isn't it? I have a little glimmer of experience from a very different angle, which is I spent 12 years trying and failing to have babies and going through the whole gamut of fertility medicine. And part of the reason I am so grateful for what you do is because you attack the language and the culture of shame that exists around quote unquote women's health issues. How much do you think the terminology is as a result of patriarchal conditioning? How much is it as a result of men being in the position of power and treating women and telling them that they're the failures? Oh, 100%. I mean, <laughs> there's no like there's no like 99.99. I mean, all of the language of medicine was created by men. You know, all of the language of medicine. And we're just now even starting to say, well, hey, maybe we shouldn't be naming body parts after like the dudes who claim they discovered them. Like they weren't theirs to discover. They were there all along. They were just the first to name them. And if women had been in medicine, maybe there would be some things named after women. So yeah, 100%, um, you know, erectile dysfunction. Boy, that's a lovely euphemism for penile failure, isn't it? Yes, exactly. You know, so you, so women get premature ovarian failure, right? When they, you know, when their ovaries, you know, stop, when they stop ovulating earlier than expected. What an awful term to say, or premature menopause, but, mm. but ovarian failure. Well, then why aren't we calling it penile failure? Like, you know, so, so when you look at the sort of the pejorative language, it's almost 100% directed at women's bodies. You know, the and even, you know, the the word pedendum, which is, you know, an older term used to describe, you know, kind of the area between the vulva and the rectum, you know, the, the Latin root is pedere, which is to shame. And, you know, men have a pedendal nerve too, but they're never really, that that language is never usually used to describe their body part, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, there's so much misogyny just baked into the terminology. And, you know, where we talk, you know, a pregnancy failure, we, well, you know, that's, that's not the correct terminology to use, first of all. But secondly, how does that make people feel? Like it's not helping any situation to describe it that way. You write in Blood about this culture of shame and the fact that there's this sense that our blood is somehow toxic or dirty or must be got rid of. Where did that start? Yeah, so I think it's a, one of these really interesting cultural phenomena. So first of all, you know, the origin of Western medicine, sort of Hellenic medicine, Greek medicine, you know, viewed menstruation as a sign of women's inferiority, right? So men, of course, were in perfect balance. They could manage their humors, but women couldn't manage their humors, and they were overly moist every cell of their body, and the overflow of fluid was menstruation, right? So it basically is a sign of your shoddy plumbing. So they didn't say that for ejaculation, though, I'm guessing. No. I'm, I'm hazarding a guess. That's virility, of course. <laughs> yes. All right, of course. So um, so this, you know, th you know, that's the seed of life, you know, of course. <laughs> of course. Yes. Um, and so so this idea that um that that menstruation then was polluting because it's this overflow of toxins, right, that your body can't handle these these harmful things. And so that sort of became baked into how everything was thought of. It was these harmful, disgusting impurities that needed to come out. So of course, then that's why when women became menopausal, they were obviously that's why your body's falling apart because all those toxins that, you know, you couldn't get rid of before were, you know, building up. And of course, you don't want to ever stop to think, well, hey, if that's all so toxic and polluting, how exactly does an embryo grow in there? Like, mm. how exactly does it grow in a toxic, polluted environment? And um, and so, yeah, so that, and that's in many religions, right? So menstruating women are dirty, they're unclean. In, you know, some religions and cultures, women can't go to temple if they're menstruating. They can't prepare food if they're menstruating. You know, they have to ritually bathe after menstruating to be clean for their husbands. And so it's quite a cross-cultural belief in many patriarchal, you know, societies. And I would say that essentially every religion, religion is patriarchal, right? So I found it a completely riveting read and it is a book that tells you everything you need to know. How deliberate was that decision that you were really going to pack this book full of every single fact as well as brilliant personal anecdotes which we'll get on to <laughs> but it felt to me quite a revolutionary act in a way. Yeah so you know one of the things I hear most often from women is why didn't I know that? 
why didn't I know that? Whether it's, you know, they went to the doctor and they, you know, they come to see me and they didn't know about this thing or they read something online and then they get corrected. I'm like, how didn't I know that? Why did I know that basic biology? And I was like, right. Oh, you're going to know it. We're going to know it all. We're going to, I'm going to give it all to you. And, and I, you know, I think, you know, my publisher probably had hoped it was going to be a little bit shorter, but I just feel that Women have been so shortchanged with information about their body. And I really wanted them to have it all. I mean, obviously it could have been longer. It could have been 700 pages, but at some, at some point you have to end a book and people have to read it and they have to be able to hold it up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, no, you can't be holding up a thousand page book. So, so yeah, so I really wanted people to have the information to put what was happening to their body in context because you can't dissect the information you hear online, for example, about contraception, unless you actually know how your hormones work, right? And you can't actually understand how your hormones work unless you actually know what a hormone is, right? So all of those things I kept finding, okay, well, we need to pull the thread and where can we start at the beginning to sort of build everybody up to the point where then they're able to digest all this information. Thanks for tuning in. And if you found this video enjoyable, be sure to check out the full episode on your preferred podcast platform. And make sure you're following How to Fail on social media for additional content and updates.